is the uh, Ryan Kimali's presentation. Uh, and uh, what you have on the screen is a big uh, bioreactor that we refer to it as a jumbo. It's a series of tubular uh, bioreactor with a total volume of about uh, 350 liters. So let's start with the microalgae. What are microalgae? Basically, they are uh, they are plants, micro plants. They don't have any roots. They don't have any shoots. So all that you have is the plant part is is like growing leaves. If you like, you just have the the active part. The microorganisms and uh, they they go from uh, 0 0.2 to 2 millimeters. Now. This may be shocking for micro microorganisms because it's quite big, but two millimeter refers to spirulina, which is actually a bacteria. And uh, you can just about see it with the naked eye if you have good uh, vision or if you take a, a magnifying glass, you can just about see the, 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 the long uh, strands of spirulina. Uh, massive biodiversity. Uh, about it's estimated you know 10 million algae species who knows but uh, there, there are lots and lots of algae species and they, they are everywhere they're everywhere they're in marine in brackish and fresh water they are in the soil even and uh, they, they are really found in every habitat the main advantage or the main attraction of microalgae for us is that they fix CO2, so they make something out of air. And that is uh, very attractive for us for several reasons. One, the substrate is everywhere. Secondly, it is uh, help can help us in limiting the increase in uh, CO2 in the atmosphere and limit uh, the, um, environmental changes. The pigments they use, of course, chlorophyll, everyone's heard of chlorophyll. It's the same pigment as in plants, but there are other, other uh, pigments as well, carot carotenoids and picobili proteins uh, uh, and other, pro uh, other, other pigments. These pigments often help to protect the microalgae, um, but sometimes are also the principal uh, uh, pigment that helps them uh, have an advantage over the other microalgae. If everyone's using all the all the other wavelengths, then there's an advantage in some of them using specific wavelengths that the others don't use. It is for for a long time we have been aware of the biotechnological applications of microalgae, and this is really what this uh, this presentation is about. So in nature, uh, microalgae have a an environmental impact in that they take up CO2 and they release oxygen just like higher plants. It's just that we must not underestimate the impact of uh, microalgae on the surface of the planet. Really, they are the first uh, oxygen producers because they also exist in the oceans, in coastal areas, and there's a lot of ocean and coastal areas in the world. Their use as food is a little bit more limited, uh, but they have been used as food, notably in Africa, in Chad, where there are alkaline uh, lakes, and uh, people have been using them for, for, for thousands of years. I've been using spirulina from uh, these uh, lakes in Chad as food source and as a, as a supplement, uh, protein supplement, without really knowing it. So we've been talking about oxygen production. What is this oxygen production? Um, it's uh, basically uh, microalgae take up CO2 with light energy, take up some minerals, and they convert it into biomass, releasing oxygen while doing that. The key factors here are CO2, light, and water because the oxygen actually comes from the water molecule, not from the CO2 molecule. It's just that on the whole, what we say is that CO2 is converted to oxygen because that's a, the way the overall reaction happens. Also, something very important is the mineral uh, ions that are taken, notably the nitrates, phosphates, uh, and uh, some sulfates. 
so that these these are removed and uh, and uh, they, uh, they they are pollutants in the environment. So when they're removed, they they help to ameliorate the water quality in the environment. Here are two different ways of growing microalgae in the laboratory. We have a uh, a uh, bioreactor on the left which is a column of uh, gas, and we have a um, small uh, open vessel on the right, which is a, a raceway. And uh, what sort of products can we expect from that is mainly the biomass itself, which is in the form of, that can be included in food. Uh, there's a promise of uh, biofuels, and the biofuels, we must not forget biogas. Uh, there's CO2 uh, usage, as I said, and uh, high value compounds such as omega oils that uh, Christoph has already covered. Going a little bit more into the microalgae metabolism. Now, I apologize for the quality of this uh, slide. Sometimes when we scan things from papers and then blow them up, uh, they become uh, quite uh, poor in quality. Um, what we're used to is light shining and providing energy for photosynthesis and the CO2 is fixed and the oxygen is released. That's what we are used to doing. And, uh, but, uh, but there are other modes as well. So the phototrophic is what we're used to. That includes light, inorganic carbon in the form of CO2, and uh, that gives you biomass. There is uh, on the other, on the right hand side, we have the other extreme, which is heterotrophic uh, meta metabolism. That's just like uh, most organisms that we uh, know, such as uh, yeast and uh, fungi, etc. And their organic carbon is used uh, to make biomass, and that process produces CO2. And in between, there's a mixotrophic, uh, where there's some of the metabolism is phototrophic and some of the metabolism is heterotrophic. And above it, you see that during the day when there's light, enough light um, energy, we can do phototrophic um, metabolism. And at night when there's no more light, of course, the organism has to adapt and use heterotrophic uh, metabolism to survive the night and to come uh, to, to arrive to the next morning. So, what is the promise of the uh, microalgae, what sort of applications? Uh, we've been talking about uh, biofuels, biodiesel, biokerosene uh, is from the oils. These can be produced, but also more and more we're talking about uh, methane generation and digestion of microalgae. I'll come to that in a little while. Uh, we have uh, medical applications, disease preventions. Again, uh, some of the sugars that's produced by microalgae seem to be quite interesting, interesting in terms of diabetes control, and uh, Christoph touched on that. Uh, and then we have the, the industrial and biotechnology large applications where we, have, we, we try to make a lot of, bio, bio, a lot of microalgae uh, in order to fix the CO2 and it's just, just another form of agriculture. Just like any other agriculture, it can go into uh, animal feed or uh, fish feed or clams, etc. Now, if you want to design a process based on microalgae, because they are photosynthetic organisms and they can be considered just like any other higher plant, except that this time the big difference is that we are only producing the leaves or the leaf equivalent. There are no roots, there are no shoots. And uh, well, just like plants, just we did, uh, just as human beings did about uh, 12,000 years ago, was uh, we have to start with the species and uh, domesticate it. So it starts with a with a, the choice of species, an adapted choice of culture system, harvesting, downstream processing, um, and harvesting, of course, which must provide biomass. And the downstream processing will give you high value fraction, maybe liquid form, but you still get le left over with a lot of uh, cellulosic uh, material that uh, must be dealt with. And that's, of course, either directly into feed uh, or um, 
into co digestion for producing uh, methane as energy. So this is a possible way to see the, the steps we have to to cross to get to a, uh, in, a what, what resembles a normal farming activity. Now we have this big choice of open bioreactors like this raceway on the left and uh, closed bioreactors uh, which is uh, on the right. If you like uh, to make a uh, it's, it's not a good uh, comparison, but uh, we can say that, you know, you can, you can, it's like equivalent to have big fields and uh, things growing in uh, greenhouses a little bit, you know, not uh, 100 percent, but a little bit of an analogy there. And uh, of course, the culture process has to be innovative, it has to be productive and above all, ethic, economical uh, to operate, to build to, and to operate. And those that economics is, is what the, the, the real challenge is here. Looking at the culture systems, I talked about open systems. Uh, these are basically small swimming pools, if you like, or big swimming pools sometimes, but they're not so deep because light has to penetrate. And they're very cheap to, to build and relatively cheap to operate. We talk about them op as open systems, but we don't necessarily need to put them in uh, outside. They can be in greenhouses, but they're still called open because uh, the microalgae culture is exposed to the air. On the right here, we have some closed systems, and it, it is again about light penetration. So we talk about uh, flat, uh, flat uh, reactors, plate reactors that are relatively thin and flat. We have column reactors, uh, annular reactors, which are again, again like column reactors, but they're, they're, they're tubes, and the tubes can be organized in any sort of uh, way. Uh, here below, we have, uh, below the open systems, we have a, a cross-section representation of what the, uh, the open system may look like, the, the raceway pond. And uh, you can see that we get, we could get some settling of micro microalgae, but above all, the problem is that light penetration, it has to go through the culture, and as it goes through the culture, it quickly loses uh, energy because it's absorbed by the higher layers. And as a result, the productivity is not so high. We get a productivity that's uh, clearly less than a gram per liter per day. That's gram per liter per day. Tubular uh, reactors, uh, the, the light path is greatly reduced, so there's more light coming in and uh, we get a higher productivity, of course, often in the range of one gram per liter per day. And on the right hand side, we have a little table comparing the different advantages and disadvantages of open and closed systems. The real advantage of open systems is in the economy, they're cheap to build they, uh, and cheap to run but they're not very efficient, so they have low CO2 fixation due to low growth and evaporation is not uh, to be ignored. The closed systems uh, are much more efficient and uh, they can be easily controlled in that, but for example, if you wanted to control the pH, it would be quite easy, uh, but, uh, but uh, they are more costly. What is important is as Christoph said, is to say, where is the market? Which species do I want to grow? What is the best system to go with that species? Some examples here of raceway ponds uh, from around the world. Uh, on the left, we have a sort of uh, quite a large uh, construction. You can see that they're like racehorses, uh, like uh, where racehorses, uh, tracks, racehorse tracks. And uh, you can get circular types that, uh, that is like a water treatment plant, typically. And uh, you can get small ponds that is quite a, a, a sort of um, craft production type of, uh, of pond here. Raceways are widely used despite their low uh, productivity because they're low in constructions low-cost uh, constructions, but really they're not that efficient. Light doesn't penetrate, mixing is not efficient, so CO2 diffusion is low, uh, they have a loss. 
Uh, and uh, the, the, one of the important factors, really one of the important factors that determines uh, productivity over a long period of time is the, uh, is the, the, uh, uh, the hydraulic retention time. In other words, because these systems are often uh, used in continuous uh, culture, is that if you, from the moment that a litre of uh, growth medium enters the, the pond, how long does it take theoretically for that litre to leave the pond? And that it, uh, it has a direct uh, relationship with productivity over time. Looking at closed systems, basically they are vertical systems where you bubble gas, including CO2, at the bottom of the system. And then from then on, it's a question of uh, what, what does the gas do, because the gas provides mixing, but it's a question of trying to retain the gas for as long as possible in contact with the liquid to do the maximum amount of CO2 exchange. And there are various uh, ways of to, to do that, different types of tubes that have been produced, and they, they, uh, they are mounted either in the uh, horizontal way or in the vertical way, etc. Again, here are different types of bubble uh, column types and uh, all the devices there are really just to provide mixing and hopefully keep, uh, prolong the time the bubble stays in contact with the liquid to do exchanges. The normal uh, materials are quite, uh, construction materials are quite hard. There are the glass or plastic, uh, less flexible systems, I've seen less flexible systems that they, did, they have to be uh, uh, quite, uh, they, they have to be uh, transparent so that light cannot can uh, penetrate. You can get high productivities from them because it's efficient mixing and this business of keeping the gas in liquid so that uh, there's a maximum amount of uh, CO2 that enters. Scale up is, is very costly and quite difficult. Now you will see some good compromises it's a relatively cheap and easy to operate. Some good compromises in the presentation that will follow from Germany by Christina. You've seen this. Uh, this is the uh, Lina exposed uh, this uh, this di uh, diagram, and uh, the task of Central Superlek, our laboratory, is here at the beginning to choose a strain and to do the first steps of uh, to provide a growth model for these strains to see what, what the actions of uh, light and energy and uh, temperature are on the growth system and then to, to do the first steps of uh, scaling up to see how robust the strain is. So that's where we enter into the project. Of course, we've organized this, uh, this uh, webinar, so we are also a little bit involved in, in uh, communication, but of course everyone in the project is involved in communication. The aim of the microalgae culture in Northwest Europe is to deal with the low temperatures and the low light conditions. Um, and as I said, it's a choice of the microalgae species, the uh, system to grow it, and what we can get out of it and market. And uh, for this sort of thing, you have to choose your microalgae, you have to choose your culture system and of course you have already chosen your uh, market. Hopefully you already have a contract with them. Uh, what we did uh, with the project specifically is we did a search in the, in the literature, scientific literature, and came across this organism in the middle, uh, Chloromonas tiflos. It has many names, but anyway, we came across this organism and it's also is the organism that in uh, alpine regions often leads to red patches on uh, the snow. It's an organism that is capable of uh, tolerating uh, cold conditions, growing in cold conditions. It's also found in polar regions and it's an organism that uh, produces a red, pig red pigment that's relatively high value. So it seems like a good target for this project. The project of Florsa started with some already existing uh, strains, uh, which was porphyridium, uh, perforium, and uh, the mixed culture from uh, Eulish. So each uh, partner had uh, contributed to which strains should be studied. Some of them, the existing strains were being grown at large scale already. 
and we came up with a new strain that could have potential in the future but has not been grown at large scale yet. Our first task was to characterize the strain regarding with its response to temperature and light and for that we did uh, factorial experiments at small scale to, to design a gross model. We're now going up to, to five liters and we're growing it in a, in a what is an unconventional photo bioreactor because it's a it's a uh, stirred vessel and of course this would never be uh, commercialized because it's, it costs too much but it's a, it's a system we know and it's a good uh, first step and uh, yes we are to, we are just uh, testing the final we are in the final stages of testing the the, the, the suitability of this strain for uh, going up in scale so I thank you for your attention. I hope that I've given you a, uh, a wide and very sweeping uh, outlook of uh, what it takes to grow my microalgae. Not much to begin with, a bit of minerals, a bit of water and a bit of sunshine. But when we go into it, there's quite a lot of choices to be made. And really the choice starts with the target product. So thank you, Benham, for your presentation. So just before the next speak, uh, I want to remind you to for the possibility to